Witchblade Collection Collector's Edition review. Now here's a bit of blast from the past. If you're an anime fan in the mid 2000s, I'm sure you will have seen quite a lot of dupe ads in magazines for the series, which at the time was promoted as a big sexy American anime co-production that you should definitely watch. I did however, so with this 2022 Blu-ray re-release, I went into the largely blind apart from some hazy memories of those ads and magazine reviews, and honestly, I came out of this pleasantly surprised. Based on the comic book series from Top Cow Productions, the story focuses on Masami, Masami Amaha, a homeless and jobless young woman who struggled to make ends meets and stop her daughter from being taken in by the National Science and Welfare Company's Child Protection Officers, but initially putting up a fight. Masani is slowly pushed into giving Rihoko up to social care, although they regret it moments later, stealing a police car and tunneling, tunneling in it at a chase around the city. Incarcerated in a local jail, she comes under attack from a fellow inmate who turns out to be a giant killing machine now as an ex-con, reacting to it strangely. Masani unwittingly unleashes her hidden powers and transfers into a sexy, barely clothed demon, able to wield the blades that spawn from her arms with incredible power. After defeating her attacker, Masani goes on the run until she is eventually found and picked up by Reiji Takayama, one of the big bosses of the technology and military conglomerate Doji Group. Before that, she is the host of the Witchblade, a powerful Asian sentient weapon. Masani is roped into Doji Group's cover up at the mishandling of its ex con bioweapons and tasks with hunting them all down. This isn't as easy as it sounds, however, as Masani soon finds herself with enemies on all sides wanted to claim the Witchblade for themselves. Given the cover of this show, you might initially expect it to be some kind of edgy trash with buxom, scantily clad babes, and while there's some of the later concentrating on any fan service is doing this show at the service, but it's only loosely based on original comics. It's evident that there's been a lot of care put into crafting a story that fits into the world and the result is a show with some great writing. Its two main focus areas are the true meaning of family and how cooperate greed, power, and corruption can affect society, which move around the more action-oriented plotline of the battle for control of the Witchblade. Of these, Masani and Ryoko's story comes off as the most compelling as the two characters have a fantastic and loving mother-daughter relationship right from the start. With great dialogues and interactions, Masani is a bit of an airhead idiot and ends up bouncing off Ryoko's mature for her age attitude really well as in a role reversal. It's other the kid that ends up looking after the plant parent is Masani, returns home battered and bruised for her most recent fight. As such, you can clearly tell any attempts to break them up will be a great mistake and they produce some very tense moments in that regard. The rest of the castro is full of broken people. Some are downright evil and deserve a good calm up pants, while others are redeemed in some very interesting ways. The vast majority just come off as beautifully flawed characters and is great across perfectly how they are awkward, misunderstood, they are genuinely uncomfortable in certain situations. This particularly applies to Reiji, who clearly has a very strategic mind in the boardroom, but is extremely vulnerable outside of it. The character development over the course of the series is excellent, and it's great to see the cast trying to overcome these flaws and emerge from all the shenanigans at the end is better people. In comparison to the Masani story, I wasn't quite as invested in the world cooperate evil side of things, as the main villains of the piece are more one note than the rest of the cast, but it's quite fascinating in certain ways it's still in intrinsically tied to the overall plot. There's a lot of political machinations and backstabbing with plenty for us as the audience to try to figure out to figure out as the story moves along. There are also some good comedic moments scattered kind of throughout the show, mostly involving the inhabitants of the housing complex that Masani and Rikoko find themselves living in. However, some elements still feel bad rather, rather dated these days, like the use of the Talking Beach episode that break up two major story arcs, and the inclusion of the pervy old man who, while funny at first, some wears teen and becomes more cringe-worthy than anything. The series is produced by Gonzo, and while the art style still looks decent from a show that was the release in 2006, you can see obvious cutbacks at certain moments based on where steel frames have been used and some of the cuts and scene transitions feel a bit awkward or juddery. Enemies designs were vary depending on what you're looking at. The clone blade wielders look really cool despite them being half naked, however the ex-cons never feel quite as threatening as they are meant to be. Some of them are definitely creepy, but the comes out their human disguises more than anything else. The action scenes are also a bit hit and miss. Fights are decidedly choreographed, but most like a real sense of impact and never really last very long until the baddies runs off to fight another day. Things do get a 
better towards the end of the series strong as it breaks out of some of his earlier Monster of the Week struggles and present a true accidental crisis for both the CD and our characters. I will say Joe that the series' soundtrack is rather good, with Masanori Takumi's score lifting some of those action scenes a bit. The opening ending themes are a bit more mixed though, as the second opening Dear Bob by Kologi doesn't fit the tune of the series at all. The rockier XTC by Psyche Lover, the series as the first opening fits a lot better. It's those as the two main ending themes, Ashito no Note by Momiko Noto and Kotsu Ahimo by Asumi Yamamoto, which has lower ballads play more on Masami's feelings of vulner vulnerability. Voice acting is also great across the board with a really strong cast in both English and Japanese, which seem to match the characters well. Both Jebby Mark and Momiko Noto really get a handle switching from Masami's bubbling, butter vibe to her darker, sexier side. The Japanese cast also features Nana Mizuki getting her chops into one of the clone B users, Maria. Later in the series, well, Akimi Kanda does a great job playing Ryuko. The English dub also features some familiar names such as Jeremy Lang, who plays fortune telling Na Naomi and Colin Clickenbird, who plays the mysterious scientist turned clone blade Reina. The series comes to use via MVM featuring all 24 episodes across 3 discs. I had a couple of issues with presentation as I found the text and the menus to be too small and not having enough color contrast for the currently selected option, making them hard to navigate. Meanwhile, subtitle borders are too thin, meaning that sometimes they can be difficult to read uh, lighter scenes. There are plenty of extras in the third distro. The Japanese cast interviews, the Witchblade Forge feature which take a behind the scenes look at the creation of the anime, into Top Crow which offers an insight. Top Crow, which offers an ins insight into the comic studio and their creators, Texas opening and endings, Japanese TV spots, and promotional videos for the series. Overall, Witchplay is a series that really surprised me with its heartfelt storyline, excellent writing, and well developed characters that really subverted its initial image of an edgy action show. It's just a shame that the action itself had a little impact until certain key moments. As he read a lot of punch here, then it could have been a real classic. 7 out of 10.